Welcome to the Information Security Forum videocast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and today we're featuring ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin in conversation with Dr. Mary Aiken, cyberpsychologist specializing in the impact of technology on human behavior. In this conversation, Steve and Dr. Aiken discuss the difference between cyberspace and real life, whether or not humans are prepared for the cyber challenges we face, cyber addiction, and more. Great to see you. Thank you very much for, for stopping by. You're welcome. Um, tell us a little bit first about, about your background, how you came to get involved in, in cyber psychology. So I'm a cyber psychologist, which is the study of the impact of uh, technology on human behavior. I first studied psychology back in the day, in the 80s, in fact. And when I first came across artificial intelligence, I was working in industry. Mm -hmm. And it was the beginnings of you know, the internet as we know it now, very, very early stages of, of social media. And a friend of mine actually was designing, building the, the first chatbot, uh, an entity called Jabberwacky. Okay. And I found that it was a learning AI, so it was a chatbot, a conversational bot, and I was captivated. So this was 93, mm -hmm. 94, and I thought, this is fantastic. And I thought this is really going to be, you know, change how humans communicate with each other. So I remember going to my professors of psychology at the time and saying, I think I've seen the future. This is fantastic. And they said, cyber, internet, you know, hocus pocus, it'll never last. Humans won't communicate like that. But what I thought about the chatbot was, wow, this could be incredible for people suffering from social isolation, mm -hmm. or it could be incredible for those with specific learning difficulties or on the spectrum. And then I stopped and thought, or maybe not. Maybe this is the worst thing that they could do. Mm -hmm. And the problem was that nothing in my training to that point in psychology equipped me to understand the impact of this pervasive and powerful technology. And that sent me back to, to the literature. I came across cyber psychology in the late 90s, and then in the 2000s, I went back to requalify, back to do Masters of Science in Cyber Psychology, and a full PhD in Forensic Cyber Psychology, which is the study of criminal, deviant, and abnormal behavior online. And unfortunately, I am kept very busy. <laughs> no, I can imagine. I mean, cybercrime is, is, is a growth industry, isn't it? There's, there's no, no question yeah. about that. The biggest growth industry at the moment. It, it, exactly, and set to continue, I think, as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that, uh, that you mentioned there, which I think is really interesting, is it was in the early days you felt that technology, cyber, could be used for good, if I could put it yeah. that way. Um, and yet here we are, you know, we're faced with an ever-increasing threat landscape, mm -hmm. attack vectors appearing on a daily basis people perhaps being, yes, the strongest link in a security chain, but but all too often perhaps the weakest one. Mm -hmm. um, what's your perspective on that? Where, where do you see it going? <laughs> well, in the immediate future, nowhere good. Right. Uh, I think we're facing a tsunami of criminality coming at us down the line online. Because I think from a point of view of how we tackle these issues, we're trying to fix it at the end mm -hmm. rather than going back to the beginning and looking at design. Right. So let's take, for example, the premise of anonymity online. So this is a central construct of the internet as we know it. Mm -hmm. But who says that it should be so? Mm -hmm. You know, at what point do we sit and, and, and challenge this premise? And yes, of course, with anonymity, when we look at the powerful aspects of anonymity, you know, the ability of a dissident and oppressed regime to, to tweet or blog or blog or whatever they want to do, but versus the downside. Mm -hmm. Over here we have cyberbullying and trolling and, you know, revenge porn and 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 the whole you know, plethora of, 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 of entities associated with cyber criminality. And at some point as a society, we're going to have to look at this and go, okay, let's talk about this. I'm not saying that that, you know, that anonymity cannot be used in a good way, what I'm saying is that it is a superhuman power, the power of invisibility. Right. And it comes with great responsibility. And 
I think in time we will see us moving towards what I describe as anonymous, beginning with an N, mm -hmm. anonymous protocols online. You know, for example, the internet was cr developed, created on the basis that all users are equal. Mm -hmm. This is not the case. Right. Some users are more vulnerable than others, and children are particularly vulnerable. So in all of this, you know, facility to be anonymous, you know, all of these concerns around privacy, let's say for argument's sake, we had a simple construct where we could just identify children, mm -hmm. minors, as a generic entity, not personalized, but a generic piece. Okay, so let's let's build on that a, a, a little bit because one of the things that struck me in in your book, the cyber effect, was the impact of technology on on children, mm -hmm. both in terms of the way that it is used as um, a diversion. I think you talk about babies and and, and yeah. the way that they're given an iPad and and you know at a very very early formative period in their lives when their brains are still mm -hmm. developing. I think you talk about the reaction of of a of a child that's being met from school where the parent is engrossed in their iPhone or Android yes. device. And, and, there was and a campaign kind of called Greet Your Child with a Smile, Not with a Mobile. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> this is the level we have, we have, we have devolved to right. where we have to teach parents to look at their children when they're waiting for them you know, coming out of school. And I think it was uh, Turkle who wrote about children in interviews saying how disappointing it was to be excited to see their parents. Their parents are buried in their devices. Yeah. And, and, you know, people ask me when it comes to infants and children, what's the best age for my child to get a device? Because mm -hmm. everybody has aspirations of their child being some tech genius, you yeah. know, starting some startup. And they think that by early exposure to technology that that might actually help that process. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So there are very specific recommendations. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics gives guidelines, you know, zero cell phones under the age of 18 months, between 18 months and two, limited exposure between three and four. So they're, they're very good robust guidelines um, issued by that organization. But what I do is turn the question around and say to parents, well, what about your use of cell phone right. around your, your, your child? And also the other siblings in the household, you know, we've got to the stage whereby babies left in the corner, you know, hoping for eye contact with the family pet, you know, mm -hmm. everybody else is distracted with their devices. And Babies need eye contact, not the, you know, FaceTime sort of eye contact. They need actual eye contact. There's no study that does not support the importance of eye contact in the bonding um, process. Children who fail to have enough eye contact with parents fail to bond. Children who fail to bond fail to thrive. And that continues right through to adulthood. You know, the thing about the face of the infant, it was designed to be the most seductive and compelling thing on the planet. That's why the internet is full of pictures of puppies and kittens mm -hmm. and infants, until the advent of the smartphone. Right. And now something is competing with the infant's face for attention. And this could be catastrophic for our species over time. And you mentioned some of the guidelines in, in, in America, for instance. Where do we stand in Europe on, on that? Guidelines are similar, so it's a world body, and the guidelines are similar. What's interesting in Europe is that um, we're beginning to see in Europe different countries taking very different proactive approaches in this space. So France recently banned all smartphones in schools for all children of all ages, mm -hmm. which is a a really significant event. And I would actually put it down to, I mean, you know, they described the rationale was that uh, children were not engaging in conversations during school right. breaks, and also they weren't exercising, so they were sitting passively on their devices. But I think there's a, there's a layer that's more interesting there, is that we see that France is very protective in a cultural context. Mm -hmm. So they're protective of their music, they're protective of their film industry, you know, they're protective of, 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 of various types of artistic endeavor. And I think they're also culturally protective in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. So I think that move was one of cultural protectionism to actually maintain what it is to be French. In England, we see the whole area, which I've been very involved in with the DCMS there, the specific department responsible, looking at the construct of online harm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And and online harm can range from cyberbullying through to exposure to legal but age inappropriate content online. Mm-hmm. Now, why is this important to InfoSec? <laughs> <laughs> the point is that when we look at cyber criminality, when we look at sophisticated threat actors, when we look at activists and hacktivists, and you know the whole the the whole range of of, of you know the sort of you know the the the, the threat landscape. Mm-hmm. The point to factor in is that this is not standing still in time. Right. So infants are being go- born and engaging with technology. Very early, inappropriate exposure to technology may be a pathway to addictive compulsive type behaviors mm-hmm. in terms of how the neural pathways are being formed. And this is a very you know, gray area in that we can't, this is not a population we can experiment with, you right. know, expose them infants and then not expose yeah. other infants. Now you get into children who become you know, tech curious and tech proficient. Now you get into social isolation and the kids upstairs who have incredible tech skills sitting up in the bedroom of their parents' home who become technology curious and start actually leveraging those skills in a cyber context. And then you begin to get into the area of cyber juvenile delinquency, Mm -hmm. that point at which they begin to cross the line. And then the pathway into lone cyber criminal and then into being exploited by organized cyber crime. So that's a 13 to 14 year pathway, which I just described. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about future threats, we have to also factor in this developmental piece. Now, on top of that, we have to layer in what you might describe the topography of how this behavior is evolving. Mm -hmm. So we have the internet, we have surface net, and we have deep web. In the deep web, we have the dark web. And in the dark web, we have dark nets. Now, let's start thinking about in 2016, NATO ratified cyberspace as an environment. Now, if we think about the internet as an environment, when kids are accessing the dark web and specifically going to dark nets, they are going to very bad neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Except compared to the real world, parents have no idea where they are. They think they are safely upstairs. And in a societal context, if your child begins to engage in uh, delinquent behavior, breaking windows, burning cars, you know, mm-hmm. there are protocols in place to stage intervention. Right. Yet in terms of this pathway into cyber criminality, we have no protocols. Mm-hmm. We have little or no protocols. I mean, I was involved as a, a principal investigator in a Europol project, which was published in 2016, which was Youth Pathways into Cybercrime. We made recommendations from that project, and some of the recommendations are now being acted on in that the NCA in the UK and the Dutch National Police are actually using interventions as a methodology to tackle teenage hacking. So instead of criminalizing the 13, 14 or 15 year old or 16 year old, they're trying to divert them into sort of juvenile programs Mm -hmm. before they become criminalized. But this is a problem for the InfoSec community Mm -hmm. because what we're seeing here is talent that is not being harvested. So we look at the skills shortage Mm -hmm. in this industry So how do we tackle that? Well, in psychology, we have IQ scales, intelligence Mm -hmm. quotient. We have um, EQ scales in terms of motion quotient. And we have CQ in terms of creative quotient. Mm -hmm. We have no TQ. We have no metric to actually detect latent technological ability at an early age. Can you imagine if we could identify the four and five-year-olds who had latent talent? Can you imagine during the education system, if we could then engage with them, create modules whereby they could be, you know, best in class. By the time they were in their early teens, they would now be rewarded in the education system Mm -hmm. and arguably would feel less of a need to go outside of that system to get engaged in youth hacking, to get the sort of kudos and peer approval that they don't get in the traditional education system. And in that way, we could actually build a pipeline of talent to enter into the InfoSec, cybersecurity, um, you know, information technologies, general technology Mm -hmm. sector, rather than that cohort turning into criminal population. 
I mean, that's a hugely transformative approach, isn't it, to, to society? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're talking about changing the, the, the real fundamentals to, to adapt to an environment that is cyber-enabled, that is... Um, the, the, the really addresses some of the shortfall issues from a skills point of view, as you rightly point out, but also um, I, I think gives some of the people that you're you're alluding to there um, a huge purpose. I mean, a huge sort of career direction, and, and so has therefore an impact on on some of the other issues that that we're starting to see as well. And I think it's a different way of looking at the problem space. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I've been involved in a dozen different research areas, everything from cyber babies through to organized cyber crime. And people say, well, why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why, why cover this spectrum? Yeah. Because everything is connected. So the problem is in a, you know, in an academic context is this myopia. Right. Even in an industry context, this myopic view, looking at a problem space through the myopic lens of a singular discipline. And what we need to do is adopt a transdisciplinary approach. Everything is connected mm -hmm. from the protocols that we use to advise and educate parents in terms of how their children interact with technology, all the way through to hardcore cyber criminal activity, it's connected. And the point at which we understand these connections, we can then start to inform how policymakers tackle these problems in, in terms of in a legislative context, in an educational context, in a sort of health and well-being interventive context. So we need to start joining the dots. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do as an educator. I mean, two weeks ago, I was speaking at a NATO event. Right. <laughs> as an educator, my job is to point out is that first of all, everything is connected. And secondly, we're not thinking about the problems in a way that is going to be conducive to architecting good solutions. We need to think about these problems differently. At the moment, what we're doing in terms of dealing with security incidences or data breaches or you know, cyber attacks is it's finger in the dam stuff. Yeah. It's like patch here, finger here. And, and, and my point is, we need to fundamentally rethink. We need to rethink the architecture of the internet. We need to rethink premises like anonymity online mm -hmm. in a societal context. And that doesn't mean that we want to infringe on the rights of uh, the right of privacy, but we have to create an internet, an environment, a cyberspace that is nurturing in a societal context. Otherwise, we're building a lot of problematic behavior for the future. I think that's a, that's been a great insight, Mary, into some of the challenges and indeed some of the solutions that we can bring to bear. So thank you very much indeed for, for sharing uh, that and, and stopping by, as I said. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll be back soon with another conversation. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe, rate and review it, and we'd love it if you'd share it in your networks. Please visit securityforum.org to join the conversation on our LinkedIn group and download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance relating to this discussion.